We're very much looking forward to exciting conversations today about pressing issues facing the United States as our country transitions to a new era of great power competition. Today's theme will focus on great power competition uh, around the issue of how the United States can impose costs and disrupt adversaries without resorting to war. We're all very excited about the great group of panelists and moderators that we've brought together today. Um, I really want them to shine during today's conversation, so I will be turning it over to our moderators to lead the individual panels, and I will do that to our first moderator on our panel about Iran, Dr. Nikisa Jahanbani, very shortly. Before I do, just want to provide a few additional reminders um, in case anybody joined uh, just after we took down the, admi the administration screen. Um, please keep your videos and microphones off during the panel unless you are presenting. Uh, please save your questions for the end and then use the hand raise feature um, uh, to show that you have a question. Um, at the end of the panel, we do only have 15 minutes between uh, panels, so please promptly exit the room if you don't plan on participating in the next panel to make room for next uh, for the next participants. Um, please remember that the panels are being recorded and that the views that you hear today um, are those of the participants and don't reflect the United States Military Academy, the Department of the Army, or the Department of Defense, or any other agency of the U.S. government. Um, with that, I would just like to give one last big thank you to all the panelists and especially to the members of the uh, USMA class of 2006 whose generosity has made this conference possible. So thank you very much and uh, Dr. Jean Bonny, take it away. You are muted. Okay. okay. I'm on. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Nikisa Jahanbani. I'm an instructor and researcher at the Combating Terrorism Center, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you also to the Modern Warfare Institute for putting together such an awesome program and lineup of experts for this year's War Studies Conference. It's not altogether surprising that a conference focused on the intersection of the United States involvement in near-peer competition, coercion, and strategy on Iran. Iran is by no means a new adversary for the U.S. However, the threat environment for Washington and Tehran has recently changed. Just within the last year, tensions have escalated considerably at various points, starting with the strike against Qasem Soleimani in January and the subsequent Iranian retaliation, and more recently with news of Iran's meddling in U.S. elections. Um, Iran and the United States are seemingly engaging differently than they had before. In light of these shifting trends, how can the U.S. achieve its goals when it comes to Iran? Meaning, how can it protect its interests and levy pressure and costs on Iran without resorting to war? And in this changing context, it's important for us to look back over our understanding of the landscape and involved actors, question our assumptions, and work on best ways to move forward. And that's what we hope to work towards in today's panel. With that, we are incredibly fortunate to have this all-star panel of experts here to impart their wisdom on all things Iran-related security matters. Joining us today are Dr. Anthony Kordsman from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Dr. Sanam Vakil of Chatham House, Dr. Ariane Tabatabai from the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund, and Dr. Chris Bolin from the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College. Thank you for joining us today. I'll briefly introduce our panelists. Um, I'll keep it very short. You can find their fuller, very impressive bios in the conference program, and then they'll share their prepared comments for eight to 10 minutes apiece. I promise to leave ample time for a couple questions from me as well as the audience. Okay, our first panelist is Dr. Anthony Kordsman, who is the Burke Chair in Strategy at CSIS. During his time there, he has held several leadership positions, including the Director of the Gulf Net Assessment Project, among several others. He has also led research concerning a variety of subjects, including national missile defense and asymmetric warfare. He has previously advised several U.S. military and policymakers, including General McChrystal and Senator John McCain. His current projects include U.S. strategic competition with Iran in the nature of modern warfare and assessments of U.S. defense strategy programs and budgets, among many others. 
Our second panelist is Dr. Sanem Veki, the Deputy Director of the Middle East North Africa Program at Chatham House, where she leads the Future Dynamics in the Gulf Project and the Iran Forum. Dr. Vecchio's research focuses on regional uh, security, Gulf geopolitics, and on future trends in Iran's domestic and foreign policy. She follows wider Middle Eastern issues as a visiting fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and she's also the James Anderson Professorial Lecturer at the Middle East Studies Department at Johns Hopkins SAIS in Europe. Our third panelist is Dr. Ariana Tabatabai, in the, uh, who is the Middle East Fellow at the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund. She's adjunct senior research scholar at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Dr. Tabatabai is also a national secure, Truman National Security Fellow and a Council on Foreign Relations term member. She's also the author of several books about Iran, uh, one of which is called No Conquest, No Defeat, Iran's National Security Strategy, published by Oxford University Press. Uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher Bolin is our fourth panelist. He is the professor of Middle East Security Studies at the Strategic Studies Institute of the U.S. Army War College, where he researches and teaches graduate level courses on U.S. national security, foreign policy, and the Middle East. He's also the senior fellow um, a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He has served um, as a foreign policy advisor on the Middle East and South Asia affairs for Vice Presidents Gore and Cheney. He's a retired U.S. Army Colonel with overseas tours in Korea, Egypt, Jordan, and Tunisia. With that, let's have the pa panelists share their prepared comments before moderator and audience question. Dr. Kordsman, if you could uh, start us off, in particular, if you could enlighten us uh, a little about the U.S.'s strategy um, towards Iran in the past and, and in present. Thank you. You're a little, you're muted, sir. Uh, Excellent. I think I should explain, I actually served in Iran under Ambassador Helms more than 40 years ago. I've been at this for a while. And I think we have had two consistent strategic successes. One has been the work of CENTCOM in building up a military structure which can largely contain and deter Iran. That is a more fragile structure today than it's been in the past, but it still is an underlying strength. The other is the strength of our country teams and our experts. But the fact is, at the higher levels today, we have no strategy for Iran and no grand strategy for the region. We left the J joint agreement on the nuclear side in May without any clear plan or alternative and without really consulting our allies, either in Europe or the region. We have watched that tension continue and it affected our efforts to extend the arms embargo this October. It freed Russia and China in some ways to act on their own. And it occurred at a time where one thing we have to face is the slow attrition of French and British power projection capability in the region. In the period since roughly 2003, we focused primarily on extremists. And from 2014 to 2019, on dealing with ISIS or ISIL without having a clear strategy for Iran and the Gulf. To the extent we had one, we announced 12 and then 13 points by the Secretary of State that Iran had to comply with to negotiate with the US and then backed away with it from it in 2019 without ever defining what our new posture was. We have put maximum pressure on Iran and we've done so with major economic effects and some political effects. We say we are not driving toward regime change, but we've never presented any alternative plan or negotiating structure. And if our goal really is regime collapse, we might want to consider what's happened in Libya, Lebanon, Syria, 
Iraq, Yemen, and Afghanistan when you actually do get regime collapse. As far as I can say, the net impact on Iran has been to increase some levels of popular tension, although one has to be careful about the class and nature of that. But it's also been to accelerate Iran's interest in acquiring new Russian defenses for the air-based systems, its capability to deliver precision-guided missiles and drones, its interest in hybrid warfare, its expansion of the political and economic role of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, a return to some aspects of the nuclear program and continued support of its role in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, as well as create a new structure in its legislature which eliminated any kind of moderate candidates from the most recent election and probably will be followed by a similar strategy when the presidential election comes up next year. We have had no strategy in any coherent sense for Syria, which is now to be dominated by a far more authoritarian Assad regime with a permanent Russian presence and far greater ties to Iran and the Hezbollah, as well as emerging tensions with an ally that is more and more uncertain in the form of Turkey. We have no clear picture of Syria's future and no economic or other political solutions to what's happening. We really don't have a clear strategy for Iraq. We have rhetoric about a strategic partnership, but we have never defined what that means, created any new incentives to help the new prime minister. We did kill the head of the Al-Quds force and have won PMF. But we've basically begun to phase out of most facilities, talk about complete withdrawal, and even threaten to close our embassy. Again, CENTCOM has been a saving grace, but we have no plan to deal with creating unified security forces or economic reform. When it comes to creating a strategic partnership with the Gulf states, We've exercised very little leadership in trying to end the boycott crisis between Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, and Qatar, the near isolation of Oman, and the problems Kuwait faces in trying to mediate. Our approach in practical terms to dealing with our Arab strategic partners has been one largely of a bullying exercise in burden sharing focusing on massive arms sales, rather than any clear effort to reinforce CENTCOM's efforts to create a interoperable security structure. And we've totally ignored the growing economic crisis inside the Arab Gulf states and the fact some are already spending nearly 10% of their GDP on military and security forces, and all of them are far above the goal we set for NATO of 2% of GDP. As we look around the rest of the region, we might note we're going to leave Afghanistan in May of next year. Uh, Afghanistan happens to border on Iran. We have somehow become tied to a civil war in Yemen, backing a candidate president who basically ran in a non-election with no opposition and has no clear support. We've not seen Saudi Arabia or the UAE be particularly effective. And we now find Iran is playing a truly major role in Yemen delivering precision guided missiles and UAVs and creating a whole new threat there. We have, I think, a high level of distrust from our Arab strategic partners as to our staying posture. 
and no clear counter to Russia or China, we have reports, perhaps unconfirmed, of a $400 billion strategic agreement between China and Iran. When it comes down to energy policy, we no longer have one in the Gulf, largely because of the idea we've achieved energy independence. And yet, when we look at the role of the Gulf in supplying our Asian trading partners, that today is a far higher percentage of our trade and GDP than our dependence on Gulf oil imports ever was. So let me put it in very simple terms to conclude. There's an old joke about a company that was trying to turn bullshit into chocolate. It raised lots of money and it spent a year in the research project. But sooner or later, it had to report to the stockholders, and it did. And it claimed with great joy it had 50% success. It solved the problem of the texture, solved the problem of the color. The only problems left were the smell and the taste. And that's a pretty good description of national strategy in Iran and the Gulf. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Kordsman, uh, for your comments. So where Dr. Kordsman's comments highlighted U.S. strategy and its consequences against Iran throughout the region, Dr. Vakil can shed a little bit of light on the other side of the coin, namely Iran's strategy encountering the U.S. Uh, Dr. Vakil, please. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and look, looking forward to um, uh, the discussion after our, all of our comments. Um, just to reflect a little bit on uh, Iran's uh, foreign policy in, and its uh, strategy to the U.S., I think one has to um, take a bit of a, a step back and think about what are the pillars of Iran's foreign policy. It's premised, um, from my reading, on three pillars, independence, a quest for independence that is historical, drawing from historical experience, um, uh, also um, defined by uh, a need to maintain Iran's territorial integrity um, and protect Iran's territorial integrity from internal um, unrest or dissent, but also obviously from external threats. And the third pillar uh, that I think is also uh, really critical and perhaps the most critical um, is preserving the security and stability of the Islamic Republic um, and how Iran sort of executes and sort of um, looks to protect these sort of pillars um, is, you know, very much formed by Tehran's threat perceptions, um, which are defensive um, and self-defined threat perceptions, obviously, but also, again, draws from its historical experience. The most obvious um, experience is rooted in the Iran-Iraq war, uh, but I think that um, we can make the argument that um, the the leadership in Tehran takes a longer view uh, than the Iran-Iraq war. Also, because you can see that reflected in Iran's constitution um, in, in trying to maintain integrity and not, for example, allowing any foreign powers to have access to military bases and the like. And that's really drawn from Iran's historical experience with um, external powers. Um, you know, I think it's important to think of these themes and sort of uh, reflect on how they impact um, Iran's uh, domestic uh, dynamics, um, particularly among the policy uh, making uh, class. Um, I, I mean, I think that there are differing views on whether politics in Iran matter. I, I fall very squarely into the camp that politics in Iran does matter. Um, and um, I'll get to why it matters, but let's first talk about how it matters. Um, there are there is no homogenous uh, necessarily um, imposed view um, uh, within the Islamic Republic. The system is consensus based, and um, you have camps within the system um, that uh, have and and share a different sort of policy views. They do share um, among them the principles of 
uh, protecting the security and stability of the Islamic Republic, protecting the territorial integrity of the Islamic Republic, and maintaining the independence of the Islamic Republic. But they differ on tactics. Um, and uh, how they um, uh, implement policy to uh, protect those themes and protect those pillars. Uh, so within the system, and this is very simplistic, um, but you you know you can have three uh, different camps. You have and those camps are not again um, monolithic. You have breaks within those camps and 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 contending views within those camps as well. But you have reformists that are. Um, uh, divided among themselves, um, and you have pragmatists or centrists, and then you have conservatives slash hardliners. Um, for my purposes of the discussion, I'm just going to simplify and, and create two camps. We'll go for the conservative hardliners and moderate reformists, because that's the sort of alignment uh, that has dominated Iran's system for the past eight years under President Rouhani. Um, and it's important to consider the worldview of those different camps. I mean, they're united in the principal objective of preservation of the regime, but they're divided in how um, they want to preserve the regime. Um, Moderates and reformists um, believe that the security and stability of the Islamic Republic is best protected through um, greater international engagement. Um, and that was very much evidenced in uh, the very long, but uh, the multilateral um, arrangement known as the JCPOA or Iran nuclear program, uh, nuclear agreement um, that was signed um, and seen um, believed to eventually lead to Iran's um, economic engagement with the wider international community and perhaps over time a uh, gradual, more stabilized um, regional environment, um, if not beyond, um, and particularly with Europe as well. Um, this is seen as, um, within this reformist moderate camp by, because by stabilizing Iran's internal relations, Iran could then focus on um, economic development and normalcy. And what's really interesting and quite unique about Iran is that its foreign policy objectives are not tied to its economic ones. Um, so uh, this, this of course, poses a challenge for the long-term sustainability um, of a country that seeks independence and um, relies on uh, principles of economic resistance in order to uh, survive, um, but not necessarily thrive, which is what we're observing today. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, conservatives and hardliners, again, divided, um, but um, have uh, let's say a more suspicious view of international engagement, uh, much more skeptical, particularly about uh, the United States and its intentions vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, and uh, they uh, are ultimately uh, seeking to protect the Islamic Republic by being a bit more insular, um, by looking to protect the regime from infiltration, um, from what they refer to as the Janganarm, the soft war that would come after the economic in integration or the economic engagement with the wider community. They are very suspicious um, for for all the reasons that uh, Dr. Kordesman, um outlined about um, American intentions of regime change vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and feel also that even if any accord is um, reached, um, similar to the JCPOA, they um, believe that ultimately the United States will always move the goalposts and seek more concessions, more demands from Iran. And, and um, we know that that is the case because the JCPOA was supposed to be the first step in um, a wider negotiation that would, would have le led to concessions, hopefully on other issues. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, but uh, the con the way, of course, policy is developed in Iran is is interesting. It's consensus based. Um, the president, um, of course, you know, the system is hybrid. Um, but while the president is elected after he has been vetted, um, the president um, appoints a cabinet and a representatives um, debate and arrive at foreign policy decisions in the National Security Council. Um, and this, this council provides um, policy options to the Supreme Leader. So this system um, and, and the, the sort of nature and the consensus of decision making very much matters. Um, again, not because the objectives are, are going to change, but tactically uh, they're going to change. And in the context of where we are today vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, the United States, um, you know, I, 
Iran is in uh, you know, quite a difficult position under maximum pressure, um, and it has exerted itself or tried to repeatedly, let's say, over the past three decades, um, be, before maximum pressure, push back against um, its perceived threats, specifically the, uh, the United States and Israel, um, through a, a regional policy that seeks to push threats away from Iran's borders. This is a policy known as its for, forward defense, and it has relied on um, asymmetrical um, advantages that it has developed and leverage building. Um, and, and this has been um, developed in sort of low cost but opportunistic investments um, in, in regional non-state actors, but also state actors. And the way uh, the Iranian system engages, um, and I know that Ariane is going to uh, uh, build on this further, so I'm not going to um, elaborate too much, is um, it, it has developed um, a sort of borrowing model of engagement in many regional countries that relies on military security ties, but beyond that, also diplomatic ties, a growing economic and trading relationship um, that is important and going to be, um, I think, a, a big piece of Iran's regional engagement um, that you know bears further study going forward. There's soft power influence tied to that, and that soft power is, um, you know, quite broad. And and one can question its effectiveness, but um, you see educational ties, cultural ties, religious ties, um, sectarian ties. You know, Iran leverages anything that it can in order to um, build relationships. Um, ultimately, also you know there is the ideology that uh, it, it tries to use um, as a sort of leader of resistance um, in the Middle East, a leader pushing back against U.S. interference and um, and the like. So this is um, in this context where um, Iran has engaged in maximum resistance against um, the Trump administration's policies. Um, and we have seen over uh, the past year and a half, Iran specifically um, through in maximum through maximum resistance, trying to um, transfer pressure um, from the United States onto other regional states, um, and, and that was very apparent last uh, summer through uh, the downing of the U.S. drone, through the uh, uh, attacks on uh, tankers and shipping um, in the Straits of Hormuz and Persian Gulf, um, through uh, the very sort of brazen attack on Abreb um, and Khores in September, through, uh, you know, it's strategy of plausible deniability in, in supporting proxy groups um, that uh, then um, uh, challenge U.S. interests in the region. Uh, we've also seen Iran's nuclear escalation that has been important in gaining uh, leverage. Um, and I think finally uh, and importantly, there is the sort of diplomatic tools that the Islamic Republic has um, been using to its advantage, uh, using the sim symbolism of the U.S. withdrawal, trying to develop um, more multilateral support for Iran's position. Um, and, and that might not be uh, sort of a winning card for Iran, but being able to demonstrate um, or, or demonstrate that the U.S. is isolated against Iran has been important um, for the Islamic Republic. So just a final note on where Iran, where I think Iran is going forward. I mean, we know that um, without, without a clear strategy, um, as Dr. Court has been laid out, it's clear the U.S. is leaving the region and Iran has sought for 41 years the U.S. departure from the region. Um, so there are no huge incentives for Tehran um, to uh, uh, really uh, do too much, I think, in the current climate. Obviously, we're waiting for the outcome of the U.S. elections, um, and that's really going to define Iran's steps going forward. But um, Iran, um, you know, probably regardless of the outcome knows it has to negotiate with the United States in order to receive some sanctions relief. But at the same time, um, through the US, uh, through the incoherent US policy, um, it has um, also managed to develop internal co co cohesion among its factional groups um, against the United States. It has also managed to um, uh, demonstrate that Iran's population remains completely um, separate from its foreign policy decision making. Um, and while they, they might be chanting against um, uh, Iran's support for proxy actors in protests, um, 
Iran can manage um, those sort of um, signs of dissent, and it can continue to um, support a foreign policy, um, a regional foreign policy above all, that, um, you know, after eight years and in the climate of maximum pressure and it, with the failing of the JCPOA um, has demonstrated that um, this strategy, um, the, the more conservative hardline strategy, is the, the successful one and the one that has shielded Iran and protected Iran, um, whereas the model of economic engagement and regional integration and beyond has actually failed. Um, so sorry to be also grim um, in, in sort of my assessment, but uh, sadly, it isn't leading to, uh, you know, productive reassessments of how Iran engages regionally and beyond. So I'll stop there and pass the baton on to Ariane. Excellent. Thank you. So let's turn to Dr. Tabatabayi for a look into Iran's irregular warfare capabilities and how these components are utilized in Iranian national strategy, um, please. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, putting this uh, this great panel together and for for having me. Um, and actually, our, our first two speakers have um, covered a lot of ground and I'm, it's going to really nicely frame my remarks here. Uh, so let me start by echoing some of the things that Sanam was saying in, in her remarks. Uh, the first thing uh, I think to consider is that uh, the sort of uh, that Iran is unable, of course, to compete with the United States in conventional terms, right? So it has been using this asymmetric toolkit that it has been uh, developing, expanding over the past four decades. And going back to Sanem's comments, uh, those are uh, the, the decision to actually develop this toolkit is historically driven. Uh, it, it, it has been around for decades um, in, uh, under the Shah and uh, the, Shah's, the Shah's father was actually trying to compete with adversaries and build up its defenses in conventional terms. And it finally realized, I guess, or came to the conclusion um, with the revolution itself, and I would say even a little before that, that it was not really going to be able to do so. And so it decided to move more toward an asymmetric toolkit. And, you know, as I mentioned, it's because it's both very cheap, but it also allows Iran to meet its ultimate objective of becoming self-reliant uh, in a way that it wouldn't be able to do if it was relying, say, on the United States as it was prior to the Islamic Revolution uh, for um, acquiring uh, aircraft and uh, spare parts and uh, know-how. Uh, and so um, Iran has really developed this toolkit, and I think it's here to stay for the foreseeable future because it allows Iran to both uh, compete defend itself, deter adversaries, harass adversaries uh, pretty cheaply, uh, pretty cost effectively, and in a way that allows it to be much more self, self sufficient. Uh, so there are essentially two, I think, core elements of the strategy that I want to highlight here today. Um, and the first one is what is commonly re referred to as the Iran threat network, which is the sort of collection of proxies uh, that Iran has been developing throughout the region. Uh, and again, uh, even the, 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 gra the groundwork for uh, this uh, part of Iran's strategy was laid out prior to the revolution. It has been expanding uh, over the past uh, four decades or so. Uh, and it's really the one of the key challenges that the United States is dealing with uh, today. And the second part uh, is actually something that has been kind of uh, in the uh, part of the background noise over the past few weeks, uh, which is Iran's efforts to build this toolkit that allows it to directly undermine democracy in the United States uh, and to a, less, to a lesser degree in Europe. Uh, and that is done through mostly cyber tools and information warfare. Uh, and of course, you know, the DNI uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, made some comments about this and, and I'll come back to it in a second. I want to talk about the overarching goal, I think, that Iran has in pursuing both of these, uh, these policies, uh, using both of these tools. Uh, and I think it's really about Iran trying to, as Sanam was saying, to increase its strategic depth and to be able to move the competition that it has with the United States and U.S. allies and partners from Iran's own immediate neighborhood into, uh, into the United States even, uh, right? And that's, I think, where we're seeing a bulk, the, why we're seeing a bulk of these activities, uh, cyber activities, information manipulation efforts in the US today is because it allows Iran to change uh, the battleground from what has been traditional neighborhood uh, to uh, move the, the conversation, the competition into the United States. 
the way the Iranians uh, see this is that they are responding to U.S. efforts to do exactly that in their country. From their perspective, the United States has been pursuing what uh, in some IRGC literature you'll see as uh, dubbed the, the continuation of war by other means, which of course is a play on Clausewitz. Uh, and uh, and they see U.S. soft power uh, as, as part of that, right? They believe that the United States ultimately is looking to weaken and potentially even uh, cr uh, sort of uh, collapse the regime internally. Uh, and it is not necessarily doing that by military means as it did in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it is doing it uh, by using uh, economic sanctions, uh, pressure, uh, political pressure tools, uh, and even public diplomacy and, uh, again, soft power, including cultural um, goods that are imported into uh, the country, uh, uh, despite the regime trying very hard to, to prevent that from happening. So the way they, they, they perceive this competition is that what they are doing today is they're trying to respond to these efforts by the United States uh, to, uh, to sort of cripple the regime, to collapse the regime, uh, and they're taking the competition here in the U.S. Uh, so um, let me now uh, focus a little more on uh, how this. The first thing is the the sort of, you know, the overarching traditional, I guess, tools of U.S.-Iran competition, of which the Iran threat network, the proxies, are sort of a core component. Interestingly, and this is sort of going back to uh, some of the comments that Sanam uh, was, was making earlier on, uh, those are also the core issues that Secretary Pompeo's 12 points laid out uh, that, that uh, Secretary uh, Pompeo's 12 points uh, sort of identified as the key challenges that the United States might must address. Uh, so that includes Iran's regional activities, support for terrorism, uh, and missile program, as well as, of course, its nuclear program. But Iran has also been using those very tools to actually counter the maximum pressure campaign, right? So the maximum pressure campaign was built to stop Iran or uh, decrease Iran's involvement in these activities. But actually, uh, Iran has been using them to build the sort of maximum resistance response uh, that it has created to the United States and U.S. policy uh, since, I would say, predominantly 2018, uh, but actually since the beginning of the Trump administration um, itself. So as a result of that, what we're seeing today is a new era of competition in Iraq between the United States and Iran, uh, which is predominantly uh, conducted through uh, proxies. Um, and that is coming after a bit of a halt uh, in this competition. Uh, during After the rise of ISIS in, in Iraq, you had a brief uh, period where you had this sort of tacit cooperation between the two, uh, the two sides. Uh, both were mostly concerned about and uh, focused uh, their efforts on countering uh, and defeating ISIS. Uh, and, and so you had this sort of brief pause in this competition that was, of course, uh, that had dominated uh, the late 2000s um, between the United States and, and Iranian proxies. And now we're sort of returning to that. Over the past uh, year or so, uh, since uh, 2019, since May 2019, uh, of course, we've had a number of incidents in, in Iraq, um, and actually very few of the, the uh, kind of uh, elements of this competition between the U.S. and Iran have played out in the U.S. or Iran. They've mostly played out in the region more, more broadly. And Iraq, of course, has been the key theater where that has, uh, that has happened. And you've had uh, targeting uh, by Iranian proxies, like Qatayb Hezbollah, uh, of uh, U.S. military facilities, diplomatic facilities, uh, and, and forces. Uh, and that's just one part of the sort of uh, broad proxy networks activities that is uh, taking place in, in the region. Happy to come back to it in, in Q&A. The second set uh, of um, sort of tools Iran has been deploying is this authoritarian toolkit I was referring to earlier on. Um, and those are tools that are designed to discredit uh, and undermine democracy in the United States, uh, and that includes uh, democratic institutions, but also processes. Uh, and this is a space where Iran was not traditionally involved in uh, a lot, um, perhaps because of a lack of resources, perhaps because it's um, due to the, these lack of resources, uh, Iran has traditionally had a more limited uh, foreign policy objectives than countries like Russia. Uh, but
has over the past decade increasingly been used, moving into that space. Uh, and again, I think that we're seeing it very prominently in this specific election cycle uh, where Iran uh, has appeared alongside Russia, I would argue still to a much lesser degree than Russia, but has appeared alongside Russia as sort of the main actor uh, looking to uh, discredit the, the electoral process um, and uh, uh, democratic institutions. Uh, so the sort of DNI presser I mentioned earlier on is part of this. Uh, you may recall from the news that uh, two weeks ago, uh, the director of national intelligence essentially noted that Iranian actors had been uh, targeting Democratic voters on behalf of the Trump campaign, threatening them uh, uh, via this, you know, the Proud Boys um, and to into voting for for President Trump. Uh, and of course, a lot of people were trying to wrap their head around why would Iran, which has been so deeply damaged by the maximum pressure campaign, want President Trump to be reelected? Uh, I, I think that that's actually a mis uh, not a very uh, good way of thinking about this. I, I think it's not necessarily about Iran trying to elect president, reelect President Trump or elect President Biden. Uh, the objectives are more uh, far reaching, right? It is more about uh, sowing chaos, sowing confusion, undermining trust in the electoral process, and divi ultimately dividing the United States uh, from its allies. As Sanam was mentioning, uh, that is uh, one of the sort of uh, core objectives that Iran has currently, is to be able to portray itself as being the one that has the upper hand in, the, in terms of multilateralism, that it is the country that is not isolated internationally. What is important to note, though, with this set of uh, actions, cyber attacks, uh, information manipulation efforts that Iran has been conducting in, in this space, is that Iran, much like Russia and China, is not actually creating uh, these cleavages, these issues in the United States uh, or in Europe. It's merely utilizing cleavages, divisions, uh, and, uh, and issues that already exist. Uh, and I'm happy to, to get into some examples uh, on, on this. We've seen a number of them over the past uh, at, at least year or so, but, but even going uh, back a little bit more. And I think there's a second objective, uh, which is uh, which sort of is complementary to, to what I've been describing, which is discrediting democracy at home uh, is also a key goal that the Iranian regime is pursuing, right? It, it is now finding itself in a place where it doesn't really have a positive response. It's not offering a positive model uh, to its population. And it doesn't really have anything to offer uh, that would com that would sort of compel them uh, to, uh, to, to buy into the model of governance that Iran is offering. And so the only thing it can really do is to try to discredit other alternative uh, models. And I think that's part of what's going on, which is why you're seeing such vocal uh, kind of commentary coming from the Supreme Leader and others about what is going on in the United States today and trying to again question uh, the, the electoral process and democracy more generally. Um, I do want to uh, end by putting all of this in perspective and again noting that, you know, I know you'll, we'll be talking about Russia later on today, but Iran is nowhere uh, as sophisticated and as effective as Russia is currently, but I think it would be a mistake to brush it off entirely as some uh, tend to do. Uh, and I want to also end by uh, noting uh, one more thing, which is that in the competition between the U.S. and Iran, the United States enjoys uh, the upper hand when it comes to resources, alliances, capabilities. But the lack of a coherent strategy, as Dr. Korsman has been has been noting, uh, the self-inflicted wounds uh, along the lines of leaving the JCPOA and isolating ourselves internationally, and our own domestic issues, uh, which are fully on display right now, are all things that allow Iran to leverage uh, our, our own weaknesses and uh, to create a more leveled playing field in a way that it wouldn't be able to do uh, if we were playing our cards uh, well. Um, and I think I'll end here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, Dr. Bolin, could you share your prepared comments and also tell us a little bit about the successes and failures of the U.S.'s deterrence with Iran? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. No, first of all, certainly thank you to the Modern War Institute for hosting uh, this important conference and also for doing so at a very civilized mid-morning hour as opposed to the military default of about a 0630 wake up. So I appreciate that. 
I do think it would be helpful to kind of employ the framework of traditional deterrence theory as at least an initial start point for assessing the effectiveness of current U.S. policy, but then perhaps also considering a better way forward. So first and foremost, deterrence requires clear and credible communications, right? The U.S. has to clearly communicate realistic expectations for what Iranian behaviors we want to see avoided. So those actions that haven't yet been taken, which is classic deterrence, or those behaviors which need to change, which would really fall into more of an area of compellence. And while the internal logics of both deterrence and compellence are similar, you know, compellence is going to be a heavier lift, right? Because you've got to um, actually change the decision-making calculus in Tehran for actions that they already view as beneficial to themselves, and you've got to reverse that calculus. So um, compellence is a much harder lift. Um, I do think at base, on this point, U.S. statements and actions have really left Iranian leaders confused as to what specific behaviors will end up in with U.S. punishment. And this started really with Secretary of State Pompeo's speech in May 2018 that unveiled the new U.S. strategy in Iran. This, uh, if you take a look at the speech, really provided a hodgepodge list of 12 overarching and ultimately unrealistic demands uh, that would effectively amount to a wholesale surrender and capitulation by Iran, which isn't going to happen. I mean, these included, just quickly to summarize, an end to all Iranian nuclear enrichment, providing the International Atomic Energy Agency totally unqualified access to any and all facilities 24-7, wanted Iran to halt its development of ballistic missiles and its military support to proxy forces, disarm the Shia militias in Iraq, withdraw all Iranian forces from Syria, and ending, you know, this kind of end of all basket of other unspecified threats against the neighbors. Well, as you know, previous panelists have mentioned, I mean, these are all activities that Iran considers as vital to its national security and defense. So these are not going to be readily abandoned. And there's also no clear prioritization in that list of what's most important. Um, at least with Obama's strategy, the U.S. priority was clear. It was attacking the nuclear file and the nuclear issues first, and at least getting them postponed, and then hoping that maybe that would provide a basis for further negotiations on the other um, activities. But there was a tremendous disconnect between the U.S. and our regional allies on this score. The U.S., you know, sensibly, in my assessment, really prioritized the nuclear issue as our primary concern and threat, whereas the regional allies were more concerned with the immediate and proximate threats posed by Iran's threat network and by the ballistic missiles. Big disconnect there that really needs to be uh, closed. Um, and I think if you do take a look at this list, too, again, this is really doesn't represent a strategy of deterrence. It really represents a strategy of compellence because we're demanding that Iran reverse course. And again, that's going to be a much heavier lift. Now, there are also three basic components of a deterrent strategy, and I think a good strategy will maximize prospects for success by utilizing all three. The first is the most talked about and most easily recognized, and that's deterrence by punishment. This is essentially the imposition of cost. If you do X, we'll do Y. If you develop a nuclear weapons program, we will destroy your entire nuclear infrastructure. And I think on this score, U.S. strategy has been pretty weak and inconsistent, as previous panelists have actually already mentioned. There were several Iranian provocations over the summer and fall of 2019 that really did not, were not met with an effective U.S. Uh, military response, right? There were uh, several Iranian attacks on international shipping in May and June. Iranian forces shot down an unmanned U.S. predator operating in the vicinity of Hormuz. And then in September, Iran launched a very sophisticated drone and cruise missile attack on Saudi refinery infrastructure. And none of these provocations resulted in any visible U.S. military retaliation or punishment. And this really undermined our credibility um, with our U.S. allies in the region as well. It was really only in December when a U.S. contractor was killed in Iraq by rocket attacks conducted by Iranian-backed militia that resulted in the U.S. missile strike 
in uh, in Iraq and and some in Syria as well that ended up killing the Iranian Al Quds commander Qasem Soleimani. So the end result of this is that if you're an Iranian leader, you're looking at this and going, well, the only thing that resulted in punishment was killing a U.S. citizen. So as long as we don't do that, we can get away with everything else. So this has really weakened the U.S. deterrent posture in the region. And moreover, as others have mentioned, there are continued attacks by Iranian bat militia in Iraq on U.S. facilities in Iraq. Our missile strikes haven't successfully deterred those. And it's gotten to the point where Secretary of State Pompeo has actually felt compelled to threaten the U.S. embassy in Baghdad if Iraqi forces can't put an end to these attacks. Uh, the second major component of uh, deterrence strategy is deterrence by denial. This is essentially, we will take steps to ensure that the opponent won't succeed in whatever actions they're trying to accomplish. And here, I think the U.S. has had at least, you know, measurable, some measure of success here. And there's deterrence by denial that is kind of defensive actions. And the U.S. has deployed additional missile defense systems, for instance. It's bolstered its forces uh, in Saudi Arabia to really minimize the prospect of any Iranian successful attack. And, you know, we've had some success there, right? There haven't been any further Iranian attacks on international shipping or regional infrastructure. So some success. And then there are also some offensive actions that you can take in this regard. And I think, uh, you know, in the cyber field, there were the Sutsnet attacks of 2010, and then more recently suspected sabotage attacks this summer on Iranian ballistic uh, missile and nuclear facilities as well. And those effectively degrade Iran's capability uh, to conduct their own attacks and pursue their own interest in the region. We've had some success there. Um, again, I think there's a risk, though, of kind of exacerbating the security dilemma as, uh, as those acts are undertaken. Iran will definitely uh, react by taking additional security measures that are going to weaken the capacity for U.S. or allied retaliation. And the third most really often ignored aspect of a successful deterrence strategy, I think, is you maximize your prospects for success by including positive inducements. So there's, there's a need for carrots in addition to just the threats of sticks or punishment. And at a minimum, Iran would have to have reassurances that punishment is going to be avoided and can be avoided if they stay below whatever the US or allied red lines are. And I don't think that's where um, Iranian leadership is, as Ariane and Sanam have already mentioned. Um, I think the JCPOA was a great example of this combination of carrot and sticks. The sticks were the economic sanctions imposed uh, internationally and certainly a host of US unilateral sanctions as well that offered the stick. But then there was the carrot. And that was the international acceptance of Iran's domestic enrichment, albeit within specified limits and under uh, stringent international supervision. So it was that combination of carrots and stits that actually worked. Today, I think uh, Iranian leadership uh, seems to suspect that the real goal uh, in Iran for the U.S. is regime change. And that's a life or death. Uh, we're we're going to fight to the death to prevent that kind of a situation. So it leaves the Iranians very little way out in terms of uh, a successful deterrence policy. And to be fair, I mean, there was even some aspect of this when Obama was in office. Iranian leaders, even then in the early days of the JCPOA, were arguing that they weren't getting the sanctions relief uh, that was promised in the JCPOA. And of course, this was exacerbated with President Trump's unilateral withdrawal from the JCPOA, despite international verification that Iran was complying with the terms of the deal. So with that, um, I'll just make a closing comment that I think, I mean, it's useful to remember in terms of deterrence theory that success or failure isn't going to be determined in Washington or Riyadh. It's going to be determined in Tehran. And again, one of the side second or third order effects of the U.S. maximum pressure strategy has had the negative effect of empowering hardliners in Tehran who are actually the most committed to continuing the behaviors that the U.S. finds most objectionable. So it's, uh, it's U.S. policy has been counterproductive as a whole. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are 
coming towards the end of the panel, so I will ask one question from the panelists and then I will uh, open it up for audience Q&A. Um, my question is, which Iranian partners, proxy states, internal actors should be the most concerning for the US and why? And this is something that um, Ariane mentioned, but are there cleavages there that could potentially be picked at by the US in its future strategy? And whoever wants to speak to that can. Um, if we could just go down the line, that would be great too. So Dr. Kordsman. I think that the most important single state is Iraq. It's the state on Iran's border. It is the state that can act as a shield and help contain Iran the best. It's also the state which, if it comes under growing Iranian influence, establishes the largest access of Iranian influence. Uh, that makes it a critical case, and it is a remarkably vulnerable state because its military forces remain very weak, except in a counter-extremism, counter-terrorism mode, and its economy has effectively collapsed. And that is something recognized by its prime minister, because if you read its new economic plan, it is effectively about as drastic a warning of economic crisis as I've seen come out of any state ever. Beyond that, I think that Syria in some ways is a lost cause. Afghanistan may be irrelevant or at least as much a problem for Iran as an opportunity. The second case I would say is Yemen. And the problem I find with Yemen is that unless you really happen to believe in hope as a substitute for planning and reality, it isn't clear there's any solution to Yemen other than the situation we've now created. And if that situation continues, Iran has great leverage outside its traditional area of operation. Wonderful. Um, I uh, share Dr. Cordesman's assessment, and rather than repeating it, I would say that um, looking to strategically pick off um, Iran's partners in an opportunistic way, maybe to model the way Iran engages in the region, um, is not something that the U.S. has proven to be good at um in the in the wider middle east um it's not nimble it doesn't build long-term sustainable relationships it doesn't have a reliable network um of actors um throughout any of the countries um it works really only at the top level um in a um predominantly military and security focused relationship um, for the United States to be more effective, um, I would suggest two things. First of all, to understand that the military and security relationships that Iran holds um, are, are much more evolved than the train and equip or command and control nature that many people speculate about. Iran builds networks and those networks are long and deep and, and familial and integrated, not just in the military and security services, but throughout the banking system, the uh, different ministries, um, in civil society, um, in uh, religious establishments. And so it's a very hard network to unravel. Um, and even if on the best possible day, you can peel apart uh some militia groups um that's not going to remove iran from any of these countries um so th i think thinking about a bit more of a holistic strategy which of course is very hard to um suggest in a u.s system that isn't strategic um in, in targeting a country like iran um it, it 
that's what's necessary um, above all. And and I would say, secondly, um, I would recommend that the U.S. again not focus on peeling apart uh, these relationships, but rather linking them all together. Maybe not in this whole regional security framework notion that is being discussed and tossed around and that I am even also working on, but looking for opportunities to bring U.S. partners to the table and develop clear understandings of what those partners want from Iran. We know what they don't want from Iran. We have yet to understand um, what uh, the Gulf states' red lines are vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And asking Iran to change its constitution is not um, it is not a policy option. It's not a demand that is acceptable. So it, you know, it's time for the U.S. if it has the larger objectives, if it's moving away from the region, if it's redeploying its resources, to think about bringing the regional issues together, thinking about them in in a sort of um, number of links on a on a chain and addressing them um, in order to, uh, you know. Think of collective uh, security building, but you know, on a on a regional level. So I also agree with everything that has been said so far, and I'll add a couple of points to what's been said. Um, the first thing um, I I think that you know one group, if if I had to single out one group that I think is the the sort of most challenging one from a U.S. national security perspective, I would say it's Hezbollah. Um, and that's because of the fact that Hezbollah is not just yet another proxy for Iran, right? It is the proxy that Iran uses uh, to kind of hold this network together, right? It's become the hub uh, and the, the the sort of the, the group that Iran uses to train uh, other groups to provide supplies, resources um, to to other groups, and so a lot of what Iran is now doing in you know Yemen was mentioned in Yemen, for example, is going through Hezbollah. So for that reason, I think Hezbollah is a is a pretty tricky one. Uh, it's also one of the strongest relationships that Iran has, uh, which makes it incredibly difficult for the United States to be able to kind of uh, to to you know solve that that issue. Uh, the second thing, and this is not a group specific uh, thing, but something that I think is uh, increasingly a problem uh, for the region is that Iran has become more willing uh, to supply more sophisticated weapons and systems to various proxies. And with some of those, it has a tighter sort of command and control structure. With some of them, it doesn't. Uh, the Houthis being a really good one where until just a couple of years ago, Iran didn't particularly trust the Houthis uh, to listen to it for good reason, because they didn't. Uh, and now it is actually increasingly supplying them with, with more sophisticated weapons. And that, to me, is going to be one of the tricky things, again, to, to address that we will have to deal with in, in the region. And I'm not sure that we have a very good response for it right now. Um, and then I want to just piggyback on what you said, Nakisa, about the um, the sort of uh, cleavages, because I think that is the more fundamental thing, right? Iran is inherently an opportunistic actor. And as long as those cleavages exist um, and you have those grievances and fragile governments and uh, populations that are not getting access to the opportunities and resources that they need, they're not getting representation, they're not included in their uh, in their uh, government structures, Iran is going to leverage that. And unfortunately, again, not to sort of uh, keep drilling on, I feel like we're drilling on a lot of bad news today, but, but I, I, I don't see uh, either the United States or our regional partners really having an answer for, uh, for to, to a lot of these issues. Yeah, so sadly, I mean, um, I have to agree with everything that's already been said. If, if you know, we were in the policy world, ditto, Roger out, I'm done. Uh, the only points I would emphasize was, I mean, I think the reality in terms of our counterterrorism operations is we need to focus on those terrorist groups that have a global reach, right? For the most part, those are Sunni extremist groups. They're not the, you know, Shia supported, Iranian supported group. So that's where our counterterrorism priority should be. Um, at best, I think, I mean, we can't hope for a lot. Um, really, interdiction efforts are, you know, hopeful. We can kind of prevent the highest 
technology and missile systems perhaps getting into the hands of the proxies, that's useful. Um, and then lastly, to underscore Ariane's point, I mean, I think we need to push our regional allies, and this is a huge uphill battle, but they've got to do more to actually fully enfranchise the Shia communities that uh, live in their live in their countries, because as long as that sense of disenfranchisement exists, it's a cleavage that the Iranians are going to exploit. So we've got to continue to push that, I think, hard with our allies and really get them to see the problems that that's causing and see what they can do rather than that what really the U.S. can do, because they are the they are the actors on the ground that can actually impact that. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Let's open it up for audience questions. OK, um, sorry, um, Christopher Recker. Hmm, we're having trouble hearing you. All right, let's go with Leif Rosenberger. Yes, uh, I have a question to all four uh, folks here. Um, with Iranian shared prosperity and a web of economic interdependence with the West uh, help to persuade Iran to reduce its destabilizing support for its proxy forces? Who'd like to answer? I can take a first stab. I suspect sure. everyone will have um, thoughts on this. I, I The short answer is no. Um, you know, I, I think that, again, for all the reasons we've, we've talked about so far, um, the economic drivers are not the main ones that are shaping Iran's national security strategy in the region, right? Uh, and uh, a lot of the things we're talking about today that are challenging from a U.S. national security perspective are not necessarily due to the economic situation. Uh, they have been, they were there before and they will be after Iran's economic isolation is um, sort of, you know, or if uh, Iran's economic situation is, uh, is overcome. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's there are deeper, much more fundamental reasons and drivers behind Iran's posture. Uh, those are historical. They stem from Iran's sort of perceptions of vulnerability in its region, uh, from its sort of view of its own capabilities. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that, you know, I, I think we can get some uh, sort of concessions here and there. We can maybe ask Iran to limit some aspects of its uh, of its activities, uh, as the JCPOA tried to do. And I, I think it did so successfully. Well, uh, the United States continued its participation in the deal. Uh, but, you know, if we're thinking about sort of offering Iran to re regain the uh, international community uh, and uh, international uh, economy uh, in exchange for giving up its proxies and missile program, I, I think that's a non-starter. Uh, and that the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign has uh, proven so far. Happy to just jump in and also um, say that this, of course, was the objective of the JCPOA um, to gradually, um, and I guess the interpretation, it was the time constraint on how this was going to take place, but that integration, economic integration, was going to uh, perhaps over time lead to some sort of moderation of Iran's regional behavior. My interpretation of over time was a generation, because at least a generation, because obviously you're not going to change the worldview and mindset of uh, a regime and policymakers um, that uh, have been formed and shaped by, uh, you know, a very long arc of history. So it's it would have take, needed much more time than what was allotted for it. And now, of course, with the predicament of um, uh, hardline empowerment inside Iran, uh, deeper frustrations and suspicions vis-a-vis -vis the United States, um, really impacting Iran's domestic climate, um, it's going to be um, even less likely that we will see um, any uh, serious um, conciliation on regional issues um, 
Uh, and uh, you know, in this climate, of course, Iran's um, economy is is uh, suffering significantly. Order, ordinary Iranians um, are under serious economic pressure, but the economy at the same time is diversifying, um, and uh, hardliners are big. Uh, resistance economy um, and and sort of that feeds into the whole independence resistance narrative. Um, so it, it's going to take a, a lot of investment and a long term um, engagement strategy to build back um, the uh, you know very fragile trust that was built uh, through the JCPOA. I think I would just add a comment here. One great danger is assuming that this is going to be a quick economic recovery and build up regardless of what you do. When I served in Iran, the population was 30 million. It's now over 80. Its level of development is basically far more limited in terms of opportunity than it was then. It's in the middle of a petroleum revenue crisis. It's affected by COVID-19. It's pursued internally disastrous economic policies for much of the time involved. And we have not yet adopted, or looked at what's really happening out there because countries like Oman are also now under extraordinary pressure. And that's true of most of the states in the region, even Saudi Arabia for all of its claims faces problems. The exceptions tend to be Kuwait to some degree and Qatar. These are really the only ones. So when you talk about this, whatever happens, it's going to be a slow grinding process of change, not something where there's some sudden answer to Iran and for it to change at all, it requires far more realistic economic leadership by an Iranian government, which is focused far more heavily on the guards, on military side and defense spending. And here it's interesting to note just how bad Iran's internal statistics are. If you consult, I guess, the one unclassified source I can think of, Iran's only publicly reporting at most about 60% of its security expenditures. So its problems are far greater than they actually appear. Excellent. We have um, three more minutes. There's a question in the chat. Um, from Christopher Recker, in 2016, Iran and China entered into a strategic partnership. Can you talk to how Iran plays into Chinese global strategy? Whoever would like to answer can go ahead. I can again take the first stab. Um, I, I actually think the China panel will be a better uh, position to answer the sort of where this fits into China's uh, the sort of grand strategy, but uh, I guess a couple of elements of response here. The first thing is that, you know, Iran, of course, is an important part of uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative and uh, China's efforts to kind of increase its presence in uh, the Middle East region. Um, China has been involved with and has pretty decent ties to all sides of various Middle Eastern conflicts, right? It's been working uh, with Israel, with uh, the Gulf Arabs, with Iran. Uh, in that sense, it's slightly different from the United States, which is sort of squarely on one side. Uh, but the difference, too, is that China doesn't really do alliances like the United States does alliances. Uh, it is important to note that these are partnerships, and actually, I don't think they're as strategic as it tends to be, uh, as you know, we tend to sort of think think of them. Uh, th there is a growing cooperation between Iran and China in military terms, in terms of economy, in terms of uh, polit political uh, issues um, and security, but. Uh, the Chinese have a long history from Iran's perspective, perspective of 
sort of promising things uh, along the lines of what you're seeing in this agreement, um, which is not finalized, by the way, uh, and not delivering in the end. Uh, that was actually a big driver behind Iran coming back to the negotiating table in 2012, uh, because it was so fed up, both at the elite level, I would add, and at the population level, uh, with uh, these sort of Chinese promises, uh, lack of delivery, uh, the fact that they weren't delivering things on time, the sort of, uh, you know, the goods and, and projects that were delivered not being very high quality, that, that was a big driver behind Iran returning to the negotiating table to be able to diversify suppliers, to work with different countries, and ultimately to build that relationship, rebuild that relationship with Europe, actually, primarily, not so much the United States. Uh, so I think it's important to put that relationship in perspective. Uh, and also, uh, one more thing I would add is that for, for China, Iran is one of many, many options that it has, right? China does not need Iran as much as Iran needs China. Uh, and uh, if the United States and China were to sort of, you know, uh, strike a trade deal and uh, sort of uh, kind of uh, take a step back from the tensions of the past uh, couple of years, uh, the Chinese would take that, uh, in my mind, uh, over a better relationship with Iran. And that's not something that is lost on the Iranians. I think those are very good points. I'd add two others. One, remember that the UN arms embargo no longer exists. And Russia and China can play this game and actually use arms transfers to Iran to play off arms transfers and purchases from the Arab Gulf. The second is that it is certainly probable that China and North Korea have provided Iran with a great deal of its missile technology and a lot of its guidance and precision strike capability. And Dr. Bolin made a critical point in deterrence theory. I would add one issue to it. There is probably no more vulnerable area to conventional strike in the world than the Southern Gulf its water facilities, its power facilities, and its energy facilities give you hundreds of millions of dollars worth of targets. And it does not take a lot to fundamentally shift Iran's strike capabilities if it actually hasn't already done it. And some Israeli experts like Uzi Rubin argue strongly that it has. Can I just jump in and say two things also? Um, I think it's important to consider this argument from within Iran as well. Um, I think that um, the timing and the release, obviously, of the strategic document is always interesting. Um, but the um, within the factional alignments inside Iran, um, Iranian hardliners are much more attracted to China because they feel that they can trust China. Um, China won't interfere um, in Iran's domestic affairs, um, you know, as a principle of um, its very uh, diversified engagement, um, uh, you know, across the region in particular. Um, so, you know, China is attractive for Iran, and it is looked at as a model um, by some uh, policymakers inside Iran. I don't think Iran can ever really strive uh, to achieve China's economic uh, growth model, um, and, but that's for another conversation. And then secondly, I would also just say that um, I do think that the Chinese see um, Iran's regional activities um, as uh, destabilizing. That is why they were important uh, behind the scenes supporters in the JCPOA negotiations, very um, quietly but um, uh, demandingly nudging Iran um, to make the concessions and get this deal done. And uh, Iran's destabilizing regional activities are, of course, profoundly negative for China's um, the success of the BRI in the region. Um, so, you know, that in itself is a challenge for China. And, uh, you know, it's unclear if that BRI engagement and investment is going to, you know, uh, continue with the same um, energy in the, in the COVID world that we're in. But, it, you know, it's important to consider um, all of these different sides. 
Wonderful. Yeah, I think Thank I might you. just a 30 second interjection here. I mean, I think this is a missed opportunity for the United States and the West. I mean, we have a lot of advantages in terms of technology, business, quality of goods that are not being exploited um, by allowing this. So this is just a missed opportunity for the, for the US as well.